Uh, right in the green, sir. Go see it. Right. In the green. Hi, this is for uh, the both of you. And what do you think is the hardest part of acting for you? <laughs> yeah. Um, do you mean do you mean the craft or or just the life of being an actor? The craft. The craft. Um, I I think being present for me. I mean, I, the funny thing is, when you're working with this guy, he's so present that you know, you all, really all you have to do is, if you've done your homework before you get to set, you just let go. And the scene's there, and he's there, and you are maybe one of the most spontaneous actors I've ever worked with. No, no, that's really true. Like, moment to moment, he's gonna react to what you give, you give him. And, I mean, I can say from experience, that's not always the case. I mean, I worked with somebody recently where I was like, he's not there. And I crossed my eyes at him in the moment, because I was like, I wonder if he's gonna see this. No. <laughs> I know, I, well, I know, I know, I know it's, <laughs> but I think being present in that way because you feel like if you can, I guess, get out of your head enough and be present enough to focus on the other person, which I think as an actor is the most important person in the scene, then then you're available and you, you stop kind of being a me monster. I think it's very easy as an actor to be kind of assessing how you're doing as you're going through a scene and, you know, did I hit that thing I wanted to hit. But to me, the special part of what we do is the thing that exists here. It's the thing that exists between the two people. And if you can be present, which is really hard. I mean, the minute somebody turns a camera on you, people freeze. You know, I think actors do kind of instinctively. But um, yeah, I think that's really, that's actually strangely very hard. Yeah. And oddly enough, I think that that, that act, the act of being present is made easier by something which is quite difficult, which some actors are quite lazy about. For some, not everyone, but there are, you know, people have different methodologies and processes and they should. But I find the hard thing is that, is this, that when you're on set and, you're, and I'm with Ren and it's, and it's a, it basically a game of tennis and that's the fun bit, is it feels like a dance and, you're, and, and if one person takes a step forward, that other person takes a step back and you're in the same moment and it feels great. Um, and that's where the juice of it is for me. The hardest part is the bit you have to do on your own, which is before you go to work and before the cameras roll, which is, the, which is to construct in your mind a context for the characters to live in so that you're not, you're not emptily being free in the moment. You're being free within certain parameters that are appropriate for the character and the story, which is, so that work is academic almost. It's academic research, it's reading, it's thinking, it's it researching, um, it's, um, and it's very lonely and solitary because nobody really does it with you. And the, but the harder you work at that, the more fun it is when you get on set because you feel like things, the things become automatic and unconscious in a great way, but they, they therefore you don't have to be deliberate. Um, and um, I suppose that was the hardest bit for me about playing Hank was the five or six weeks of, of very solitary, um, study that I did to to sound like him and to look like him and to understand his psychology so that when I turn up on set with Ren or Lizzie or Maddie or Cherry Jones or Bradley Whitford I was free to just be in the moment with them and it's serve in return um, and that feels much more complicit and much more um, uh, gratifying than the very solitary academic stuff. Like some actors say that uh, just like in life, the trick is really listening. And so yeah. it, it was kind of related to what you guys were saying. That yeah. Even though you know what the line is going to be, to really listen to the other person is really yeah. part of the key. Yeah. yeah. We have time for about two more. All right. Uh, right, right here. Okay. Let's go actually towards the back. Uh, first one on your, on your left. Yeah. Can I just say that you really inspire me as an actress, and I loved all of your works? But this one actually really touched my heart. Um, I was wondering, because Hank had an interesting life, like it was complex yet exciting, uh, what did you actually find most fascinating about him? Um, I think, I think honestly, it was uh, that the more successful he became, the more lonely he became. Um, uh, 
as a, a friend of his used to, a friend of his, I, I, I got in a documentary about his life called Danny Dill. There's some beautiful interviews with Don Helms, who, who lived to a ripe old age, a steel player. And, and Danny, who talked with him a couple of times, used to say, um, uh, hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't get pictures in the back row. Okay. Uh, so Danny Dill used to say, the, the thing about Hank was, uh, all his life he wanted to get up there, uh, get up on that stage and be somebody. And he got up there and found there was nothing there. It was all back down where he'd come from. And that was tragic to me, that, that actually he spent his whole life trying to get on the Opry, trying to be a star. And the more successful he became, the more famous he became, um, the more he felt like people were trying to to slice him up and, 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 and take from him something that he, he didn't feel he had possession of anymore, and it only isolated him further. And from that isolation, he made consistently bad choices. He fell into terrible um, habits with alcohol and with prescription drugs. He was unintentionally cruel to people who loved him. Um, and it was as if his, his, his fame ate him up from the inside. I found that really fascinating. Sorry, I'm asking one more question. I was wondering how it was working with Elizabeth Olsen because she's one of my favorite actresses. She's amazing, truly. Um, she, like Ren, is, is is so present and such and such a and she's so alive in the moment. And I think what she's done with Audrey May Shepard, you know, Audrey has a has um, in the history books has a, has a, a bit of a rough ride. Um, she's been written as as impetuous and shrewish and destructive. And without Audrey, really, there is no Hank. She, she had a great head for business in a way that he didn't. She introduced him to, um, to his business contacts, to the producers of radio stations. She ended. She got him on the opera. She made those calls. Um, and, and I think also, as I hope you can glean from the film, is that. Their relationship and that their, the passion and turbulence of their marriage became the uh, the, the engine for Hank's songs. I, 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 that's my that's my idea and that Mark's idea is that we agreed that you can't have, to 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 be inside that marriage it has to have an effect on your songwriting. Um, and I think um, Elizabeth played Audrey with such compassion. And from such a place of, of, of empathy, and she defended her, and um, she fought for Audrey in a way that I think is gives her. You see through Elizabeth's performance how hard it must have been to live with a man like Hank, and I think that's a, a, a beautiful gift to Audrey's legacy. I want to wrap up with just a question about the about preparing for the music. You mentioned going away for a couple of weeks to try and really kind of get him down. There is a story about a dog. And about preparing for these dogs that you want to you want to share with them. That was a very good story. Um, okay. Uh, so I don't know how many of you may know. I I, I prepared for this um, by going to Nashville. We shot in Shreveport, and I went to Nashville five weeks before principal photography uh, to live with a man called Rodney Crowell, who is um, an extraordinary musician in his own right. He's been making music for 40 years. He's toured with Emily Harris. He's won Grammys. And uh, he saw Hank on his father's shoulders at the age of two. It's one of his earliest memories. And he was my, my guide through the woods, the dark and thorny woods of trying to get this right. And um, he used to, he, he, <laughs> he's such a keeper of the flame. He was so exacting in his notes about my singing. We'd be in his studio at the back of his house, and he'd be at the soundboard with his friend and son-in-law, Dan, who's a terrific sound engineer. And I was struggling with Lovesick Blues. Lovesick Blues is really technically challenging. The yodel goes up, you go up and down and up and down, you have to hit the yodel on the right pitch and come back down, and he sings out of rhythm. The stuff Fred Rose says in the movie is true. Everyone thought Lovesick Blues was terrible. <laughs> and, and it was a terrible idea to lay it down as a record, and he insisted that when he sang it live, he got this great response. It made him a star. Anyway, I knew I had to get the song right. And we did take after take after take after take after take. And I was going crazy. Bang, bashing my head against the brick wall, basically. 
And um, uh, if I, you know, Rodney would say, Tommy boy, we gotta go again. Your rhythm's good, your pitch is fine, but you're not rocking it. You gotta rock the song. So I would go again, and eventually, uh, Rodney, Rodney has this little dog, this little spotted dog called Mono. And sometimes he'd be in the studio with us, just chilling. Um, and I couldn't, I must have done 40 takes of Lovesick Blues, I was singing for five hours, and I said, Oh my God. I just couldn't get it, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, gentlemen, I have to take five minutes. I just have to take five minutes. I know we're gonna keep going, but I'm gonna step away. And I took, out, I took Mono with me, this tiny little dog, and we went out and sat in, in Rodney's garden, and Mono had such a blissful um, and ignorant, unaware delight in the afternoon sun. <laughs> I had no idea the battle that, that I was fighting. And um, he came up and he sat on my lap and I just looked him in the face and I said, Mono, how am I gonna do this? <laughs> and uh, Mono didn't do shit. <laughs> he just went for another lap of the garden. Um, but it was uh, it was nice to have his company. Um, there was uh, just some white knuckle moments and some sleepless nights on this because I just didn't think I was going to get it. I really didn't, um, and I couldn't find a way around it. It was like climbing a mountain, and you can't find a handhold up the next piece of the cliff face. Um, uh, and as I knew I had to get to the summit, it was a terrifying thing. But here I am sitting in front of you, so.